The opening line of Anna Karenina says, happy families are all alike, but every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Today's guest comedian, Gary Veter, is totally one that proves this with a deeply personal true crime podcast, Number One Dad. He seeks to reconnect with his estranged father, Manny Veter, a con artist whose lies and schemes span over, ready for this, four decades. Number One Dad is distributed by iHeartMedia and Will Ferrell's Big Money Players Podcast Network. New episodes are available every Monday on the iHeartRadio app, among others. So before everyone goes, oh, he's so familiar. Well, A, he's a very talented and comic who has comedy specials. He made a name for himself when he went all the way to the finals. In season 10 of America's Got Talent, his hilarious new comedy special, It Could Be Worse, is also now available on YouTube. Gary, welcome to Group Text. Thanks so much for having me. I want to get into your podcast. Right off the bat, you share that your dad was a con artist of the highest order. For sure. If you had to do a top 10 list, what ranks number one? I mean, there, cons? there's so many because the way one that he would live his life is that everything was a scheme, but you know, there are schemes that involved me and that one in particular, which was uh, the biggest scheme that I was involved in with him. Uh, he would say that we work for sports illustrated for kids. This is back in the nineties. I was and, just going to ask about that because yeah, I gotta say in a sick twisted way, I kind of love that he was sneaking into games and yeah. using you as the like the look over here. For sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could get away with a lot with a kid, and my dad definitely took full advantage of it. So back in the 90s, he would call up Madison Square Garden and say that we work for Sports Illustrated for Kids. He would uh, say that I was a kid reporter and that he was a photographer. And then we'd go to uh, the garden. They would give us press passes. And I'd go to these games. We went to over 50 games. This is back between the years of 1993 to 1997. Went to these games completely for free without a ticket. And then at the end of the games, I would go in the locker room and I would meet and interview the players on both the Knicks and the Rangers. And then also eventually the opposing teams as well. So I met some uh, pretty impressive people over the years. So this is when uh, celebrities, I mean, they still go to the games now, but uh, back for a few years, they weren't going. But during my time, I was meeting uh, Cindy Crawford, Bill Murray, Richard Gere, every news anchor that you could imagine. And then when it came down to meeting the players, I interviewed Michael Jordan. I was at this famous game that he scored 55 points uh, and it wound up being a legendary game known as Michael Jordan's double nickel game. But also, you didn't just, well, first of all, the fact that he was in so deep with Madison Square Garden that you guys actually had press credentials right. made me laugh. But not only did you get to interview Jordan, you were allowed to inter interview him privately without Correct. any other reporters. Yeah, nobody else, nobody else was there. Nobody else could get access to him. He was just returning from his first retirement announcement. So he retired from basketball for about 17 months and then came back, and it was his first game at the Garden. He's only played about five games to this point back in the NBA since he's coming back from retirement. And when I met him, he was in a private locker room with just him and the assistant coaches and somebody from, I guess, Jordan's uh, team, they led my dad and I into this private area because they knew that we wanted uh, an interview with them and that we they believed that we were actually Sports Illustrated for kids. So they led us to this area, and that's where I met and interviewed Michael Jordan. And I only asked him one question. Again, I was a kid reporter, but I wasn't, I wasn't good at what I was doing by any means. I was there to get an autograph and a picture. And you asked? And I asked him what I asked him what his favorite food was. I I could only remember one question that I had, and that was what What's your favorite food? And then he said steak. And then, uh, yeah, then we we left the garden. And what was crazy about this particular experience? And at this point, we probably ran the, the scheme twenty to thirty times. Uh, this is in nineteen ninety five when I met Jordan, and for the, this is the first time ever this ever happened. But the actual Sports Illustrated for kids, they were there at the garden, and my dad. At this point, he could have just said, you know, today's not the day. We can't do it. We're going to get busted. 
but he actually went up to these guys. They were it was adults. They uh, Sports Illustrated for kids at the time. They didn't have kid reporters. It was just two adults, the uh, adult photographer and adult reporter that was working there. My dad went up to them, got their business cards. I don't think he led on to who we were, but he was uh, he got their information. I guess just to use it in case he ever needed it. And when it came time to getting in, because every press. Uh, everybody in the press wanted to get an interview with Jordan. We were the only ones that, as far as I saw, were able to get in because security was so familiar with us by being at the Garden this many times. And obviously, I stuck out as being a kid reporter. And then when it came time after I interviewed Jordan, when we were leaving the Garden, the actual Sports Illustrated for Kids, they were still trying to get in. They haven't gotten in at this point. Well, of course they were going to, you know, pick the kid to come in. Yeah. If it makes you feel any better... One time I was on a red carpet and Tom Cruise was coming and they had said he was going to talk to us and I was doing another interview. He slid around the back of me. I didn't know it was him and put his arm around my waist. I turn around and I'm literally, I'm not a tall person and nor, nor is he yeah. eyeball to eyeball with him. And here's what I said. And this is, I'm a professional on E at this point. This is not a new territory. Right. I turned around, I looked at him and I came up with, Hi. <laughs> so, yeah, it's tough. That was all I got. I get it because, you know, and Tom Cruise, just like Jordan, there are these people that are on a pedestal. So it's, and I, you know, I'm a kid at the time, at the point, I have a little bit more of an excuse than you did. You should have been, no, I'm kidding. But well, the, no, and by the way, <laughs> it wasn't my first time meeting him socially oh, really? or on a red carpet, but I'd never been that close, like yeah. that physically close. And it's just like, it's intimidating. Hi. For sure. It's hard. And yeah, these people are just so that, you know, they're such put, they're put on a pedestal. They're such public figures. How are you going to act is you're going to be, it's like an out of body experience really. When yeah, you're meeting one of my, them. my finer, finer moments. Did you and your dad have like the high sign, like a, you know, like a sign, like, Oh shit, get out. <laughs> no, there was, there was nothing like that because any type of jam that my dad was in, he always seemed to, figure out a way of how to get out of it. So, oh, actual Sports Illustrated for kids, they're there. No, you know, there's no, you know, it didn't matter, my dad. He didn't care. He'll just continue to go with through, uh, through with the scheme. He had he had no problems with whatever situation there was, how to, how to find a way to get get through it. It, it It's, and, and your, how you tell the story is amazing. At 15, you chose to cut ties completely right. with your dad, and we'll get into why, but after having your child, suddenly you felt this need, and, and you talk about it very poignantly in your podcast, the des desire to reconnect. Right. Yeah, when I had my own son, so this is back in 2020, I started really thinking about my relationship with my father. And then I look at baby pictures of me, and I just see my son in there. So I'm just reflecting on how and why my dad did made some of the decisions that he made why did he choose to live his life this way and 24 years is a long time of not speaking to a parent or you know anybody in your family and curiosity what is he up to now and if he's a different person is there a chance at reconciling so you know you hear about all these situations where a family member might be estranged from one another and then they don't get a chance to say goodbye or say their piece and I figured, hey, maybe there's an opportunity to get my my thoughts across, things that I wanted to say for you know a long time, things that I buried, memories that I buried, and maybe I could approach my dad in a constructive manner and get those answers that I've been wanting to hear. And here's the thing: when you're actually when you are trying to reconcile, and I've realized this as, as I as a the goal is to to reach out to him and to talk to him as I try and do this, I, I've come to realize, you know, you put a lot of pressure on the situation, but you can't, you realize you can't put too much pressure because your expectations will never be met just like they weren't met during your childhood. So you kind of just have to go through with it and then see, see how it goes. And it, you know, if it time does come to meet my father, it's going to be a process. The re relationship isn't going to just be mended in that first meeting. You talk about, um, that you used to look at your friends' families and you were sort of jealous of how 
they seem quote unquote normal because my family was not exactly normal, but in a vastly different way. What was your first clue that your family was different? Mine was in utero, but that's a whole yeah. separate thing. <laughs> right. Yeah. The, I mean, the first things would be, I mean, everything my dad was trying to do was a scheme. So if we're going out to a restaurant, he's trying to figure out how he's going to get a free meal, you know, a free appetizer. Anytime he could get something for free or comped on the bill, it's always just this quick thing. He was in uh, the telef- uh, telephone business, so he would know how to install telephones to various businesses and he would also install pay phones this is back in the 90s and a lot of times when we'd be wanting to go eat somewhere a place that we were going to be going to all of a sudden their phone system would be down and (laughs) my dad would just happen to be there to repair their phone system and now voila here's here's free pizza and a caesar salad at you know a nice italian restaurant and uh you know, not every time restaurant has a nice pizza, but you get the point. I it get the be, point. For me, back then, pizza was like gourmet. So yeah. I, uh, that, that, and this is a, a normal thing that would be happening. And my dad just seemed to get off on these schemes. He loved lying. And those were the times where you, you just, when you go out to eat with your father or your family, you want it to just be normal. Eventually, you're like, I don't care that we got it for free. I'm a kid. I just don't, want my friends who possibly walking in to see my dad having a conversation with somebody trying to get a free meal. Uh, again, a, a startling similarity <laughs> with yeah. our childhoods. Um, my parents didn't run cons, but they would clean out a hotel room mm-hmm. of all the minis every day so they would keep replacing them. And we used to have this big thing, big containers in our house. I didn't have a full bar of soap till I went to college. I grew up on the minis. And my mom used to say that an unattended housekeeping cart was God's way of saying, help yourself. <laughs> like, I went, by the way, and it, um, something else in common was your father ran the business out of your home and admittedly my family's business was run out of our home but different right yeah how weird especially so much in hindsight was it getting the calls in the middle of the night about furniture that wasn't delivered or you talk about having to be silent so people wouldn't think you were home which by the way my grandmother used to make my mother and her sister do under the dining room table for relatives that would show up unannounced right so yep. again, again, these weird similarities. No, no, it's definitely a connection. My father, you know, people he he cheated a lot of people out of money. So he put my my family and definitely what I guess you know, looking back on it, we were definitely a, a dangerous situation because you know money obviously means a lot to people and it causes a lot of anger. And when he was in both the payphone business and the furniture business, his furniture business eventually got uh, a basically sued by the New York New York state and they wanted to put him out of business. And eventually they, they did for stealing over a hundred thousand dollars back in the eighties from customers. And we used to get knocks at our front door from people demanding money, demanding that he send the furniture, that he stop the lies. And then also we'd get calls at different parts of, of the day where my dad had a huge, uh, a phone that had I mean, a million lines on it. You'd be like, "How? who has eight different phone lines? But my dad did. And then when he would answer, it would be a different voice, not leading on that he was who he was. And this was just a common thing. And you're just kind of watching this actor play a part every time he had to deal with a person because he was screwing somebody over for some reason or another. What was the last straw for your mom? I mean, the, the last straw was i mean it definitely has to come down to it, it it's not i wouldn't say it's just one thing as far as i know you know my dad and this this stuff i didn't even say in the podcast but my dad would be gone for two to three weeks at a time nobody knew where he was so he'd be he'd just pick up go and then we wouldn't know if that would be the last that we would see him and to be honest the house was so great when he wouldn't be home 
because there was finally some sort of peace there. You, you, you almost started living a normal life just for those two, three weeks. And then you would come back and you, it kind of really kill the mood. And <laughs> this is when I was be 15 years old. And I think from my mom's point, she saw the life that he was leading, saw how he was not only treating her, but treating our family in general. He didn't have our best interests at heart. He didn't have my mom's or my sister's and my best interests at heart. He was all uh, selfish, and every decision that he made was all about him. And that definitely played a part in her ending things. But they dealt with things that, I, for a, a lot of legal reasons, I can't get into that are even deeper than the podcast. And for like, I would I would have loved to include it myself. But there are things where I couldn't get confirmation on, so I can't really get into but it's some uh, picture the darkest thing that you could imagine and then that's that's in it do you think your mom when did your mom know this was going on because i can't imagine yeah that she went into a relationship or married someone who had this kind of life because she really was a pillar for right you and in, in yeah. her whole family growing up did you ever but, ask her how what was it like when they met when did she catch on yeah, so unfortunately, when uh, with the podcast, I tried getting my mom on it, and then for legal reasons, she didn't want to do it. But everything that I know is that my parents, they met when my mom was about 19 and my dad was 21. And so they met pretty young. And, you know, when I, I guess you're a 19 year old girl, even though it was common for people to kind of get married at, at a pretty early age, she didn't really know what she was getting into. She was, yeah, this, here's a, a quick talker, just like everybody else. She was swindled and she, she, I guess, saw some charm in him and liked it. But there's no way that from everything that I've seen and heard is that she knew fully of who he was. And of course, uh, as I, I've learned more about my father by doing this, his, his schemes definitely um, got more and more evolved, evolved into bigger and bigger things as time went on. So yes, he was uh, always a guy, he's always a guy who lied, but over time, those lies became bigger and he became better at it. And I think my mom became trapped. She was a stay at home mom. And the money that my dad was providing was the only money that she had access to. So she had to play ball and it's unfortunate and kind of my sisters and I, we were just unfortunately there. We had to go along for the ride. What about, cause it did cause waves throughout your whole family. What about your relationship with your grandparents? Where yeah. were they in all of this? Yeah. My, my dad's parents, we had a, unfortunately my sisters and I, we had to cut them off because it was, it, it, they were in a tough situation. They're my father's parents Obviously, they're my grandparents, too. And they were somewhat left with, they had to pick a side to who are they going to go with? Are they going to go with their son or their grandkids? And they were very loyal to my father. And it came a point where my sisters and I had to decide if we're going to still have a relationship with them. Because if we did still have a relationship with my grandparents, it also meant still talking to my father or having him have access to our lives. And I just simply, me personally, I didn't want him to know anything that I was doing. I wanted to cut him loose. I wanted no contact. And it was a sad decision that I had to make, but it involved not talking to my grandparents anymore. And when I was 15, when I cut off my father, that was also the last time I, I spoke to my grandparents and I never got to speak to them again after that. Now that you're a dad, do you realize what a difficult choice that had to be for them? Yeah, absolutely. I can't, you know, I, I say it in the beginning of the podcast, especially when I'm talking to my wife, just about my relationship with my son and not even understanding how a like a day goes by and I can't imagine not talking to my son or FaceTiming with him. And that's a situation that my father has been in his life That's and vice versa, me too. But when it comes to my grandparents thinking about that, uh, that must have been very hurtful. I, I can't, I can't imagine. And it hurts me now in just talking about it because I wish I had a chance to still have a relationship with them. And it's unfortunate because you don't, you can't make that up. You can't make up for that lost time. 
No, and what a painful decision they had to make. Yeah, and absolutely. I can imagine having to make that. You can't win. You can't win in that situation no, whatsoever. There's, there's zero. Nobody wins. Um, you started conducting interviews with your father's friends and business associates, mm-hmm. and everyone's very guarded because the way it's explained is they're fearful of retribution. What yeah. does that mean? I mean, retribution is be- a very serious word. Yeah. Like, you know, I said it uh, earlier with you is that my dad always seemed like he had a way of getting out of everything. So you look at what a con man is and people think Bernie Madoff or the guy from Catch Me If You Can, Frank Abagnale Jr. But my dad has been creative enough to stay out of prison. He, as far as I know, hasn't made millions of dollars scheming people, but he's made just under the threshold where people could keep him off the radar. And to to an extent, obviously he's gotten in trouble. So when it, when it comes down to you know, who my father, I already forgot. The, what was the question? The question was about his friends and business. Oh yeah. The retribution. retribution. Sorry. Yeah. So that's okay. My, yeah. I don't so, mind. I, I, sometimes we just go the long way back to it. Yeah. It's yeah. Like was, crude. Yeah. Crude. Sometimes. Yeah. I was like, I was going to figure it out as I kept on talking and I was like, I what do was that the question? all the time. <laughs> no. I mean, what could these, what does he have on these people that they're literally fearful? Yeah. yeah. I don't I know mean, if he he necess- think they're going to turn yeah. them in for something. I that I that I don't know other than yeah maybe he could have something on them but as far as I know they they just uh, uh, for sake of maybe being sued they just wanted to keep it kind of low key with what they were actually willing to say but uh but obviously we do get across from a lot of people the kind of person that he is and they do uh they do speak to some of my dad's strengths in terms of lying and being able to manipulate different situations what do you, I mean, how much did you know about what his relationship was with his father? Because we're uh, all products, yeah. for the most part, of the environments we grow up in. Yeah. Which does not look, not a good thing for you or I, but I like to think right. we're breaking the chain. We're, yeah. We're, we're, but, you know, I'm just obviously joking. Oh, about yeah. My yeah. family, not so yeah, much yeah. yours. Um, what do you think a relationship with his father was like that he became this person? Right. Well, you know, speaking of breaking the chain, I would like to think that, yeah, I, I did too. And I've changed, I changed, you know, the way that I was supposed to be because I wasn't shown actually the best way to go about life. And I think my father did that with his grandfather. I think my, my grandfather was a a good guy, a, a good man. And he worked really hard. He was a baker and he didn't have a lot of money, but he was providing for his family. And I don't really know the relationship that he had with my grandma, but they were married their entire lives and very old school marriage. Then they would yell at each other, but that seemed normal to me. It's, you know, they, they got married at a very early age too, but they definitely cared for each other and were there and they, they loved each other from what I hear to the, to the very end. But my dad was nothing like his father and i think he my dad was just somebody who wanted more than a life that he was given and he saw conning and scheming as a way to do these things and my dad would take on roles of you know pretending to be a cop and he had a cop car and he would make he would pull people over to threaten them and he impersonated a lawyer in his life and he did these things and you kind of wonder where the effort that it takes to do these things, a lot of them, you could have actually been those things as opposed to just saying you were and, and jumping through hoops. It takes that mindset to actually pretend where that, that same energy could have been used for actually becoming them. Yeah, I, I was going to ask you about that because y- you hear that in all these stories you've also talked about in the past with some of the, you know, catch me if you can, all that. The amount of effort it takes to do these things again, you could have been a lawyer. You could have been a pilot. You could have been a doctor. You could have been a wall street guy. And yet the compulsion to make it a game is fascinating to me. For sure. Yeah. He was good photographer, but yet would rather lie to say that he was a photographer and we're going to the games and who knows, maybe if he legitimately 
reached out to Sports Illustrated for kids, I would have been a leg- an actual reporter going to the games with my dad. I don't that when you think about that, he was calling up the garden to say we were these things. Why couldn't you just pitch them the idea? That would right. have been that would have been probably accepted when you think about it. Totally. Um, however, <laughs> <laughs> you did run a little bit of a scheme in college, right? Which, from my opinion. Having gone to a university that has a very famous business school, you would probably have been called a genius, gotten an A, and been the next great entrepreneur for seeing a void and filling it. You stole final exams and then sold them to other students. Right. They did it in Animal House, too. But Yes. I, at my school, that could have gotten you an A in a project. Why did you think it was okay to do that? Well, I definitely knew it wasn't okay, but I knew just like my dad would always say, there's a way to figure out everything. So in my situation, I was in college, I was in an accounting class and <laughs> I'm I, sorry to laugh. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't <laughs> good at so perfect. I wasn't good at accounting, but there are two lecture halls, um, and I was in the second one, the one that was in the afternoon. And every time there was an exam, I realized that the teacher would lay out the exams in alphabetical order. So they would do that in that first lecture hall. And all I did was I would go there, take a random person's test off their desk, make them think that maybe we screwed it up and we didn't have every, we didn't have every, every person's name on, on a, on a test. So they just made it, make them think that they made a mistake. And I just go in this lecture hall that I wasn't a part of walk in walk right out with an exam and then I would have about two to three hours to do this exam. And by me doing it, I'm saying I would give it to somebody who is way smarter than me and they would fill it all out. And now they would get a good grade and then I would have the answers and then I could uh, disperse them to other students. You know, and, a good thing you ran that when you did because AI would have put that immediately out of business. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it, that's the th- that's the thing is, and that's the same thing with a lot of my dad's scams. You know, again, there is always a way, even with AI, because there's human error, and you could always find kind of like that glitch in the system. But yes, in this case, and I'm sure how colleges are now, things are a little bit more difficult. But you also have everybody has a phone now. There's there's something that you could have. There's probably maybe it's even easier to be honest how to figure it out. Oh yeah, and you can buy notes. It's just a whole separate thing, right? Um, do you ever rehearse in your head that if you get a chance to talk to your dad, what you will say and how you will say it? I never. You know what? I uh, I've never thought about rehearsing i have ideas of what i would want to say and it's but goes back to that expectations thing where you kind of want i think you kind of want him to do the talking you want to hear what he has to say does he show remorse i don't want to force anything i don't want to lead him on to be like this is what i want you to say and now you're going to say it because you know that's what i want to hear i i want to see if it's coming from the heart and so Obviously, I have thoughts about uh, things that I, I do want to say. I don't know, certainly know if that would come in a meeting one, but it might it might come in over you know over time. You know, maybe getting a few meetings under my belt with him and being more comfortable because, as you know, he he might not be a person that could deal with criticism. So you got to be very delicate with that. I mean, this is a person that that probably doesn't think that he is wrong for a lot of these situations and wants to point the finger at somebody else. You know, the brain of someone like that is so complicated, which sometimes makes the victims, so to speak, overthink. How would you ever feel like he wasn't just running a con on you in this situation and sucking you back in? Yeah. That's what I personally would be worried about. Like, and then you go home and lay in bed and question everything. Yeah. Well, you know, I guess one positive of having him as a dad is you always question things. So no matter who you're talking to, so dealing especially with him, you really can't take him at his word if I do get that chance to talk to him. So you kind of take it with a grain of salt and and think, you know, is that is that actual truth that you're hearing? And 
you, you know, then dissect it after that. But yeah. it's it's definitely tough because when you're dealing with somebody who's lied their entire life, how could you take anything uh, and, and believe that that's, that that's true? Have you heard if he's heard the podcast or listened to it? As far as I know, he has not heard the podcast. So that's that's a positive. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to digress. I'm going to roll back time because I would be remiss if I did not ask you about yeah. America's Got Talent back in 2015. Um, on the show, you were asked about your family's reaction to, to your success on the show, and you were very funny, saying um, you weren't telling them ahead of time so they couldn't get mad till after the fact, and also so that they wouldn't ask you for money. Um, how, how do they take that now? Have they got, because 2015, it's been yeah. a chunk of time. Well, I didn't win any money, so maybe that, that, that changed things too, but they, uh, they were proud of me. They was, I, they were in shock that I made it that far. And I don't think that, uh, you know, it, it was a while ago, but I don't think they knew until I got to the third round, which was when you would perform live at Radio City Music Hall. So that's when they officially found out. Maybe I told them a couple days before. Not my dad, just I'm talking about my mom and my sisters. That's when they, they knew and they were happy for me. But I, yeah, I wasn't... I never really cared to share much about myself and I wasn't huge on social media back then. So, which obviously is not great for a comic if you're not uh, constantly promoting yourself. But mm -hmm. with family, I was very much, uh, you know, I would keep to myself and I wouldn't share much about what's going on in my career because there, there's disappointments right around the corner and I don't want to share the disappointment. So I didn't know if it was going to keep on going, but once I got to the quarterfinals and made it to that Radio City live round on TV, uh, I, I decided to share it with them, and they were, they were very happy for me. Do you realize in hindsight of that, first of all, it's lucky that you did not know what a bad room Radio City is for comedy. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's it, terrible. Oh, my God. It could God. be le more, no more less intimate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it just, oof. Um, but do you think your ignorance of what it was in that size of a room s helped you? Yeah. If I knew what, I, I think it seats about close to 6,000 people. Oh, yeah. And if you actually know what 6,000 people laughing sounds like, you're probably, you're probably going to get it maybe like 1,500 to 2,000. So, and that's as a comic, only because it's such a difficult situation that you're performing in front of various acts. Not everybody's a comic. So you're kind of just going with the flow, and then you're following a music act, and now there's a huge break, and now you're going on to a cold audience. But fortunately, it sounded great, and I, I was able to keep on advancing, and then it was able to make it to the finals. But definitely not the, the best situation for comedy at all. No. And all you wait for is that first laugh and hope that you're hearing it right. Correct. Yeah. And you're on live TV, so you don't really get a chance to react as maybe you would normally would. And it's a huge crowd, so it's tough. You've got so much going on right now. What do you have coming up? What are you excited about? What's next, you know, other than being a dad? Are there, like, you... You really do have a ridiculous amount going on right now. Thanks. Yes. I mean, well, we got the podcast right now. We're on uh, episode six. It gets released weekly. So I'm focused on that, doing, you know, different types of promotion stuff, which, which is fun. I, I enjoy definitely talking about it and, and trying to get the word out because it's podcasts that might not only be good for somebody who's interested in cons, but also somebody who might have be detached from their family. And they it's good to hear it. Good to hear a story and see maybe how somebody else did it. And maybe if they're thinking about reconnecting with somebody, it could lead them down the right path. Uh or maybe you just find it that that it's entertaining. And then and, yeah, yeah. your stand up special. Oh yeah, and then I have a stand up special right now on YouTube. So if uh if the podcast brings you a little sadness, you could be cheered up by the stand up special called It Could Be Worse, which is on YouTube. Number one dad distributed by iHeartMedia and Will Farrell's Big Money Players Podcast Network. New episodes are available every Monday on the iHeartRadio app. Definitely check it out. I've I've been enjoying it tremendously. Gary, total pleasure. 
Thanks so much for having me. I, I appreciate it.